Well, hello and welcome to another Dev Nation. I'm excited to be with you guys all here today. We're going to have a great session here with Justin. Justin is coming to us from San Francisco. As I mentioned in the chat, I'm running from Atlanta today because I'm here as part of Dev Nexus uh, as the conference here. So if you don't know about Dev Nexus, you should. It's a great conference based out of Atlanta. It happens every year about this time. Uh, and anyone in the US should come, but anyone in the world should come. But we have a couple hundred people, maybe more on the line today. Make sure to put your questions in the chat tab. I'll be chatting with you in real time as Justin is rock and rolling through this conversation. But we're going to talk to you about messaging today and message brokers and the JMS API and all the magical things you can do in that world. So I'm actually excited about this because messaging is actually a huge thing for all of us as enterprise software developers. This is a key element of our architecture, key element of everything that we do when we build a large scale enterprise application. So Justin, at this point, please take over and get started here. Thanks a lot, Burr. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start the presentation and uh, I'll talk about myself once we, we get this rolling. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me, everybody. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Red Hat. I work on the Red Hat AMQ messaging uh, product. Uh, in, in specific, I've worked a lot on clients in the past, so that's that's why I'm presenting to you today about JMS 2.0. JMS has been around for a long time. Uh, it has a lot of uh, depth of knowledge built up around it. And then a few years ago, I got a big update. Uh, I want to tell you all about it. Uh, the other other thing that's changed is the landscape around JMS, around around everybody, uh, to more modern techniques of deployment. Uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna jump into how you build modern event driven applications with JMS. So JMS is 20 years old as of uh, it, it's more than 20 years old as of this year. It started out in 1998. I didn't start using JMS until a little bit later. So the version that I'm familiar with, familiar with is JMS 1.1. I think that's the version that a lot of people are familiar with. And then in 2013, JMS 2.0 was introduced with some important changes. And so we're gonna talk about those uh, just now. First, let's talk about what's good about JMS. Uh, JMS introduced some important concepts that have had tremendous influence in the world of messaging. Uh, multiple connections and inside connections, multiple sessions, so that you can have more than one conversation at once. Producers and consumers, so that you can link to multiple resources in the context of one conversation. Cues and topics, these, these represent two different patterns of communication that are, are very common, point-to-point -point communication, and then uh, with topics, pub-sub or publish-subscribe, or many-to-many -many communication. And then in, with JMS, we have a model for the message itself. Uh, the message is not just an opaque uh, stream of bytes. It, is, it includes metadata, includes properties, uh, and, and uh, fields that people know how to use and operate, interoperate with. And I would say that the, the, the big deal with JMS is it popularized this model for messaging to such an extent that, that a body of knowledge has built up now that has empowered a lot of people to write great, reliable, applications based on this technology. And all of this is still there in JMS 2.0. JMS 1.1 uh, was not without a, a, few, a few problems. So we'll talk about uh, you know, what are the problems and what are the problems that JMS 2 solved. So one big problem in JMS 1.1, this is the one that I would select as the most important, is that the persistent send operation, persistent send is the default send mode in JMS 1.1, uh, is synchronous. That means that your send call blocks waiting for a round trip communication with the remote peer. The send call blocks until the, the message acknowledgement is received back at the, at the caller. So suppose you have some code where you, you're, you want to perform messaging operations, but you want to mix it with other stuff. You've got other work to do. You, you can't really do that while, uh, while you're doing these send calls. This is a bit frustrating because async messaging is really what messaging is great at. This is this is this is one of the core competence, competencies for messaging. So so this one is is a major pain point. So on these diagrams here, you can see the vertical dimension is time. A send operation goes out from the sender to the receiver, and it waits for an acknowledgement. And in that period, your sender is doing nothing. With asynchronous sends in the in the lower diagram, the amount of time, the total amount of time required to perform 
a set of send operations can be considerably less. And in the meantime, you have the ability to perform other work. In 2.0, there were a number of uh, what I would say niceties, uh, API improvements, quality of life improvements introduced into the API. And I've selected uh, some that are my personal favorites. I think, I think different people have uh, kind of feel these things differently. Uh, and so you should take a look yourself. But for me, uh, one of the big ones here is accessing the payload of a message. In 1.1, it required a lot of casting. Uh, and it required, you can really clean up the code that deals with payload access for messages. And obviously that's a common operation. It's really, it's really important. JMS2 also introduces new alternative classes for interfacing with producers and consumers and a few other things. These are lightweight, lightweight objects rather. And so you can introduce them into a context uh, relatively cheaply and they, they offer an improved API. For instance, if you want to set message properties for sends, uh, you can now do that without raising a bunch of JMS exceptions, which uh, I think was a pain point for me. It made it pretty awkward to deal with uh, just the content of a message. If you are running your JMS program in some kind of container that does injection for you, there, there's a lot more in JMS too to enable that injection and it can really simplify the wire up. So that's, that's API stuff. On the other hand, there are a few new capabilities. I won't go into depth here about these new capabilities, but they are, uh, they are relevant to sp specific use cases. So if, if you needed shared subscription or you needed delayed delivery, it, has, it addresses some of those use cases now. But here's the big one. The big one is JMS2 enables asynchronous send. Uh, the interface is called completion listener. It has an on completion method that you can use to get called back when uh, the acknowledge is returned from the, from the remote peer. If you're using the new interface, the JMS producer interface, you use this by calling set async that puts the producer in an asynchronous send mode. And then that's where you supply the completion listener and then you can send. It also works with the old 1.1 uh, JMS interfaces, the producer, and it's just an additional argument to send. So what this means as a consequence is I, I, I avoid that, that bad scenario where I'm blocking the sender thread when I'm performing these operations. I have the option to do other work and I can just be overall much more efficient in my JMS program. JMS2 has been around for almost six years now. So there are a number of uh, implementations available. Uh, I have, I, in this example, I'm using Apache Cupid JMS. That one uh, underneath, it uses the MQP10 protocol. That's a standard protocol uh, that works with a bunch of different uh, servers and other, and other clients. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of standard at two levels, right? So you've got the JMS standard at the API level and you've got the, AM, the protocol standard AMQP running underneath. Okay, so on the server side, uh, I'm gonna be using ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ is, is widely known. It's been around for a long time and it's, uh, it's extremely popular for good reason. It was introduced in 2004 and it became an Apache project in 2007. It built up a ton of features. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything quite like it. Uh, it's, it's, it's the kitchen sink, I, I think, of, of uh, messaging features. So you've, you've got specialized queuing behaviors, uh, ways of dealing with slow consumers, anything, anything you might want. The problem is that the, the, the classic ActiveMQ implementation has been around so long that it is now showing its age. And this has, uh, you see this particularly in performance. You see that the, uh, the performance that you can get out of the existing architecture is, is not up to modern standards. And so the active MQ community is aware of this and they've been working on a, a, a new architecture for their core broker. Uh, and that's what we'll be using today. It's called active MQ Artemis. It's the next generation of active MQ. It has an efficient core designed for asynchronous operation, just like messaging itself, the, the, the core architecture is asynchronous. It has a fast persistence layer and it can optionally use uh, native async IO on Linux for, for an extra bit of performance. And then like ActiveMQ Classic before it, it speaks uh, a lot of message protocols, uh, standard protocols, AMQP, MQTT, Stomp, and uh, OpenWire, which is the protocol that ActiveMQ Classic used or uses. 
So what about the world around JMS? JMS is, has uh, been around for a while and it's gotten better recently. But man, the deployment environment, has that ever changed? The, the kinds of deployments that we, that we see are radically changed by two technologies. The first is Linux-based containers. These, this is a tool that I'm sure many of you have seen and used. It, it encapsulates network services to make them function more or less like appliances. It's lightweight, so it's easy to deploy, and it's portable. It works in a lot of different domains. Uh, it's often used in, in, as immutable snapshots. It includes an infrastructure for distributing these images and tagging them. So that, that as a consequence, as a developer, you have, you have one line access to, to many of the, these services and that you can deploy them immediately in your, in your environment. This started with Docker, uh, but now there are multiple implementations. And here's the other big technology, Kubernetes. This, so when you have one container, that's great. Docker's all you need. Uh, Linux-based containers are, are gonna get you pretty far. When you need to scale up to an architecture, architecture that includes multiple components communicating over the network, you need something to orchestrate those containers, to manage their operation, to make, to make that system reliable and to expose multiple services as a single logical service. Uh, and that's that's Kubernetes is is a set of tools for doing this, uh, and it's there's really nothing quite like it. It's it's very advanced. I think a lot of people now are starting to use this, and you'll see in my example. This is kind of my focus. I want to show people the mechanics of using Kubernetes to take uh, traditional applications that may have been based on JMS and how to how to bring them over into the world of Kubernetes. And then one note here about microservice architecture. So when people build applications these days, they tend to build small services that are, that are built for purpose, they have a narrow purpose, and then they communicate over the network. Um, this is a place where a lot of people have used HTTP and REST interfaces, but this is also a fantastic fit for messaging. This is, there, there are things you can do with messaging that you cannot do with HTTP. With messaging, you can do store and forward, that's not easy to do with HTTP. With messaging, it's natural to do uh, pub sub multicast message distribution. That's not easy to do with HTTP. So there's, there's a role for this. Uh, there's an important role for messaging here. All right, so in my example application, I'm gonna talk about how you can use two technologies together, two APIs together, JAXRS and JMS. And here's the architecture. For a lot of applications built on Kubernetes, external access is done via HTTP. It's a lot easier to do HTTP access typically. Um, you can also expose AMQP directly, but today we're gonna to talk about HTTP access. For this application inside the cluster, all of the communication is gonna be messaging. It's gonna be messaging based on the AMQP protocol. So in the top half of the diagram, you see an HTTP client communicating using HTTP to a sender service running inside the Kubernetes cluster. This sender or service, that's where we're using the two APIs. On the incoming side for HTTP requests, we handle it using JAXRS. On the outgoing side for messaging, we use the JMS API to communicate with the Artemis broker. Inside the broker, we have a topic called example strings. That's where we're going to send the messages we receive from the outside. And then we go down to the bottom half of the diagram, you see the receiver service, so that's going to consume messages, again, using JMS, and it's gonna surface those messages using JAXRS and then over HTTP. So we're gonna walk through kind of the developer mechanics of using this, uh, and, uh, and that's that, so here we go. Um, let's dive into the, uh, this kind of a distilled version of the code here so I can point out some places where, where JMS is, is we're using features of JMS too to, to make things a little bit nicer. So here's, here's the sender code. This is the, the REST endpoint. It's pretty, most of you are probably familiar with this. But if you look inside the body of the code and you see what I'm, you see the, uh, the use of the lightweight JMS producer object here. So instead of storing this in a member variable, I can create one on the fly. It's cheap enough. This gives me access to the simplified JMS API and then I'm using an asynchronous completion listener here because I've made a choice as a developer. I don't wanna block the, the send handler, the thread managing the, the send uh, for the completion, for the, for the acknowledgement of this message because I don't need to. 
So I've used, a, I've used async send here. That's a choice that you as a developer get to make. You get to make it if you're using 2.0 because JMS offers that to you. With JMS 1.1, your, your choices were more constrained. So we're gonna, we're gonna take advantage of that choice here. We're gonna return immediately upon uh, sending the, the message asynchronously. On the receiver side, we're also going to use asynchronous communication for messaging, but this one's been around for a long time. The, the message listener has been around since, uh, since JMS 1.0 from the very start. Um, so again, we create a lightweight JMS consumer object we set the message listener on it. Um, I take advantage of the payload accessor here, get body to clean up the access to the payload of the message. Otherwise, this would have required casting to particular message types. And it's, it's not bad, it's just a little awkward. And I think this is a lot nicer. Uh, we, we have an in-memory collection here to store the the result of the asynchronous receive operations, the listener. And then uh, as HTTP, HTTP requests come in to, to fetch those messages, we just return from that collection. So let's, this is a, a snapshot, a little picture of how the deployment works. So on the, this, this is a very lightweight application. There, well, it's two applications, but let's take the sender. This is very lightweight. There's no, there's no large uh, container framework involved here. It's basically, it's a JAXRS implementation, and then it's it's a JMS implementation. In our case, keep it JMS. And I'm just using the standard Maven assembly plugin to generate a fat jar with all my dependencies. And then on the right, in the Docker file, I have a minimal Docker uh, base image. Uh, I install my, my dependencies, and there are not very many dependencies in this case. Uh, I inject the jar that I've created. You see that bit there about changing permissions. That's to, to work with the security context of uh, basically the, it's, you don't want to run your, the, the application code in your container as root to avoid possible security issues. So that's, that's how you typically deal with that. There's metadata for the port I'm exposing. And then finally, just I, I call into my, my entry point. I call into jar. OK. So here's the part where I step through the mechanics. So I'm going to be using Minikube to demonstrate the developer experience. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is set up my Minikube instance, or my shell here, really, to uh, communicate with the Docker instance running inside Minikube. So Minikube provides a command to enable this. Uh, so if I do eval minikube docker env this is going to inject this is going to con configure my shell so that i have direct access and i can test that by looking at docker host in my environment good that means that when i push an image it's going to go directly into the docker instance running in my kubernetes instance my local instance another thing i've done is i'm using kc here as an alias for kubectl kubectl is the and that uh, developers will typically use to work directly with a project in Kubernetes. So the first thing I want to do is start my broker service. I'm going to use the kc run command, the kubectl run command, to create a broker deployment. So I have an image of the broker registered at Docker Hub. And I will. Let's give it the full path there. All right, so it's created my deployment. And now I need to expose it inside the cluster. So we've, we've created the deployment and the related pod, but we haven't created the, the network service that will serve to expose it to other services inside the cluster. We do that with the kubectl expose command. And I reference the deployment that I just created and tell it what port to use. 5672 is the AMQP port. We're using AMQP for communication. All right, so that's my broker. Uh, now I'm in the sender application of my example. You can see that this is a pretty conventional Maven-based project. First thing I'm gonna do is build it. Now that I've built it, I'm going to generate my 
Docker image. I'm going to call it sender. I've got a Docker file here that's ready to go. All right, so now we've built that image and we've injected it into the Docker instance running inside Minikube. Now I'm going to use kubectl again to create that a deployment for my sender service. Use the sender image I just created. Now here's a little detail that's worth mentioning. When you're developing in this fashion, your deployment will fail if you don't prevent Minikube or, or Kubernetes from trying to fetch the image from a remote repository. So we've got this argument here that prevents it from doing that. And finally, we need to pass in some configuration. These, these, the sender and the receiver service are both defined to take an environmental, an environment uh, argument that references the uh, host they need to connect to, the, the message, the broker rather they need to connect to. Uh, and the value here is broker. That corresponds to the service that I just created above. There's DNS running inside of Kubernetes and it will resolve uh, the service names to the hosts where these services are running. Okay, great, I've got my deployment. I'm going to explode, expose it, deployment sender. This one is exposed as port 8080. Now in this case, I want to expose it inside the cluster, but I want to also expose it outside the cluster so I can demonstrate doing real things with Kubernetes out in the world. So I'm going to add an argument type node port. That tells Kubernetes to not only expose this inside the cluster, but also expose it on a special port outside the cluster. All right, that's my sender. Now let's get our receiver up and running. And this is a typical project. Build it. Gonna generate the image. Create a deployment. As before, we tell it where to connect to. All right, I need to expose this as a service. And externally. Okay, let's make sure we, we did what we, what we wanted to do. So we should have some pods running for each of these. And we do, we have our broker, our receiver, and our sender. Let's make sure we have our services running. We do, we have our broker service running internally. We have a receiver running internally and externally via that special port you see there, the 30314, and our sender running externally as well. Now, in order to do this demonstration, we're going to uh, save the URLs for these senders in some local variables. Minikube offers a facility for finding these, a convenience. You name the service and you ask for the URL. I'll save that there. And you can do the same for, or I'll do the same for the receiver. Okay, so this is what that looks like. All right, so we're ready to we're ready to use our service and see if it's all working. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the sender, and I'm going to query its readiness. Okay, that one's ready. Okay, that one's also ready. Okay, so we're ready to send HTTP traffic into uh, into our Kubernetes-based application. Uh, I'm going to do curl post, we need to send the uh, content type here, send strings, I send hello one to the sender, my endpoint is API slash send, 
let's send a couple of those. Okay, so now let's talk about what's happened here. I've used HTTP via the curl command to send requests to my sender service. The sender service, upon receiving that request, immediately sent an async message to a topic on a broker, and it returned OK to, rec to, to acknowledge that it had sent that request. Now I'm going to use the, a completely distinct service, the receiver service, to per perform the reverse operation and then read from uh, that from that same topic. This is post dollar receiver URL. And then the endpoint, the HTTP endpoint is API slash receive. You get three messages. Hello one, hello two, hello three. Okay. Uh, that's the, the simple demonstration. Uh, I, I have an example project that uh, we will that we will post here so people can find all of this code and it will link to this presentation so you all can uh, follow yourselves. Uh, I think we're, I'm all done, so I'll uh, stop sharing and I will give it back to Burr to answer some questions. All right, we do have some questions. And actually there's a good one from Nuan here. Does JMS 2.0 support something similar to AMQP routing? And I don't know, I've never looked at that. So AMQP has this really clever routing capability. Does the JMS protocol API support any of that? It, it does support it, but it doesn't, de it doesn't determine it. So we, in general with, with, uh, with JMS, you can take advantage of that kind of routing. Uh, you cannot typically configure it directly from the JMS client, not, not in a lot of detail. What JMS gives you is basically the notion of queue and topic for those two different communication patterns. But you cannot, for instance, with JMS, rebind, uh, let's say, the, uh, you know, you're probably talking about exchanges and queues. You can't rebind an exchange to a different queue from the JMS API itself. That would be a server side operation. OK, and not from the AMQP API Java client libraries? Like, is there more flexibility there? Absolutely, yes. If you use, so JMS is, existed before AMQP, and it is not closely bound to, to the AMQP protocol. But there are APIs that, that are much more closely bound to it, and they give you that kind of control. OK, another great question here is, with the JMS publisher subscriber classes, is there TLS support? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. you, you get it uses the TLS offered in uh, the JMS library, and it's you know it's quite capable. And for Artemis, is there AMQP and TLS support? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And there was one great question I saw earlier about what if I have two Kubernetes clusters and I want to active active set up amongst them. And I did respond to that one with the link to the previous session we've had on this topic where we actually showed that, demonstrated the fact that we could spray transactions around three different clouds, uh, to, to, and in this case, Kubernetes clusters to illustrate that point with what's known as AMQ router or the Qubit dispatch router, which was not an area of conversation today, but it is an AMQP based endpoint also. Okay, and uh, let me see. I'm just trying to capture a couple more questions, though. We are out of time. I apologize for that. We always seem to run out of time. Uh, I did add a link to the code samples. Um, let's see here. What, recommend, what recommendations to develop manifest files for durable modes, multi-partitions, et cetera, to guarantee high availability? Uh, so I think that's primarily a concern uh, for your your Artemis deployment, you're not the not the client per se, uh, which is fine. That's fine. I'll answer that question. Uh, Artemis offers uh, various forms of high availability. It has a shared nothing version of uh, of, sh of high availability, and also offers shared store based high availability. Uh, so you can you can you know dive in and take a look at the different options there. From the client perspective, mainly you're going to be concerned about stuff like reconnect and failover, so that you can the client itself can reconnect to the working cluster. And what is our recommended backing store for HA now with AMQ? Uh, so a lot of people use NFS. Um, we we also support uh, technology such as uh, Gluster, FS, and uh, NCEF. Okay. 
And then uh, we're about out of time, but there's a couple other questions I think that are interesting here. So with AMQ 6.3, I don't know if you remember this, uh, and this is kind of going back in time, there's JMS 1.1. Uh, and yeah. so what they're trying to say is, uh, how does JMS improve on this? So basically with JMS 1.1, they felt they only had queues, did not have topics, therefore it was harder to simulate a pub sub behavior. How does JMS 2.0 address that or improve upon that? Um, I don't think it really improves. I think with 1.1, uh, the topic capability was very good in JMS. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, with respect to this stuff, JMS just sort of streamlines its use. It doesn't uh, add any new capabilities. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I thought there was nothing new from a Q topic perspective. It's just cleaner syntax now. Yeah, exactly. OK. Well, we, we are out of time. Uh, I apologize for that. And hopefully, you guys got a link to the demo the code sample. And then I know Justin may clean that up further as, as he wishes to go forward. Uh, you will get an uh, email about this recording. You can always check out the uh, YouTube playlist for further recordings, plus the previous sessions we had. As I mentioned, there was the one on AMQP specifically for working across the hybrid cloud. That's a great one to also check out for the messaging-related art uh, artifacts and messaging-related context. Uh, but Justin, thank you so much for today's presentation. I did. You, I love the demo actually because I really love being able to see that at the command line using stuff for real. That's really fantastic, and the presentation was really fantastic. So thank you so much for that. All right. Thanks.